artists and hairstylists, various technicians that are involved with Albert Knobs. Uh, next, we have Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part Two. Please welcome to the stage Nick Dudman. <laughs> Nick is credited as special effects, and Nick joins us today from London, England, where he is working on the completion of the makeup and hairstyling for the Warner Brothers Studio Tour. That's going to be uh, a great um, uh, place to see. Uh, because it's going to be on the lot where Harry Potter was filmed. And so they'll have a lot of the, um, the stages and, and different areas for people to see. And next time you're on London. This is the first Oscar nomination for Nick. His other awards include eight BAFTA Award nominations for Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1 and 2, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Ashvan, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, <laughs> Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, plus Batman, <laughs> and the fifth element for which he won a BAFTA. Please welcome Amanda Knight. Amanda is credited as the makeup designer. Amanda joins us from London, England, where she's working on the completion of the makeup and hairstyling for the Warner Brothers Studio Tour also, and will be uh, starting Fast and Furious 6. <laughs> this is the first Oscar nomination for Amanda. Her, her other awards include five BAFTA Award nominations for Harry Potter, Deathly Hollows Part 2, <laughs> Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Ashban, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and uh, she won one Hollywood Makeup Artist and Hairstylist Guild Award for Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> also, please welcome L Lisa Tomlin. Lisa Tomlin is credited as hair designer, and Lisa joins us from London, England, where she is presently working on the completion of makeup and hairstyling for the Warner Brothers uh, studio tour. And also, we'll soon be starting on Fast and Furious 6. <laughs> this is the first Oscar nomination for Lisa. Her other awards include two BAFTA awards for Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 and Harry po Potter and Deathly Hallows Part 1. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two was uh, filmed in England. Um, so, this was a project that went on for how many years, Nick? Um, ten years. Ten years. Okay. So, you and. Amanda were involved in, in all of the films? Uh, yes, we were involved in um, all of them, and then Lisa joined sort of a little later on. But we, we've never had parole, have we? <laughs> well, that's great. I think we could open the, the uh, curtain, and let's take a look at some of the clips that we have here. Now, this was a, a great accomplishment. You... you if you have seen all the Harry Potters, you know that some of these characters went all the way through. You know that the, that the, um, the kids grew up. Um, you, in fact, you even saw the kids who were grown up and had kids at the very end of, of this last one. Um, in the very first film, we saw some of these characters that were in the bank. Um, these, I thought, were just outstanding. You want to tell us a little bit about what was involved with some of this? Uh, yeah, well, on the very first Harry Potter, I was first approached to discuss the Gringotts Bank sequence because ILM had done a digital goblin test, and I was basically shown that and asked if I could do it for real because digitally it was going to cost too much money. And I said yes. And Would then you say that out. again? <laughs> Digital was going to what? <laughs> Cost um, too much money. 
Yes, it uh, was a large amount of money. But then I realized that these people were prepared to spend a large amount of money on makeup, so that was okay. Um, we, we basically uh, decided we would attempt to do the lead goblins in the very first picture in silicone, which at that time was very um, iffy, and you, you know it was a scary thing to attempt to do. So we did actually have backups uh, where we could run, we'd run foam in the molds if we had to, and there were a couple of foam goblins as well, and a load of background heads that would just pull on silicon heads. We got away with it. Um, one of my crew, Paul Spiteri, who's been working on Potter for 10 years with me, he really sort of troubleshot how to get the silicon to behave enough for us to get away with it. But when we came back um, in seven part two, 10 years later, we, in that process, you know, suddenly silicone is easy. It's straightforward. It's, you know, so many people are using it and it just looks better and it's great stuff. So we decided we would do everything in plat gel. And we also made the decision that any goblin would be a close-up goblin. This did get changed slightly, so we did have some background heads. But we had around 40 um, prosthetic characters. And every single one was sculpted as an individual character from Lifecast. Every single one um, had no nothing in common with anything else. So we, took, we made our own wig blocks for each character. We made our own wigs in-house. And we produced all the pieces. We had no lace eyebrows. Everything was punched for every single day. And we just kept tweaking. This picture up here is Warwick Davis playing Grip Hook. On the very first day of shooting that character, we were in Wales. And we had a, we'd raced to get him ready. Uh, originally, he had a goatee beard and all sorts of things. And we found that the thing with Potter, unlike a lot of movies, is that your producer can come up and go, hey, that's fantastic. That little line there. So we re-sculpted the whole makeup. And then we re-sculpted it again. Um, the idea being that you just refined. And just because you've shot on something and you thought, that's not bad, but oh, hang on, if we could only do that little bit more, we were able to do that. So actually, in this picture, Grip Hook sculpt is really quite crude compared to later on. And in fact, this scene was never in the film, so it didn't matter anyway. Can we see the next clip, please? It's still me. Um, <laughs> I've lost some weight. Um, <laughs> this was actually, th this was fun because I've worked a lot with little people over the years because I've kind of done a lot of genre movies where they call little people in to play parts. Um, and this, this is a lady, her name's Diane, and she is, what do you reckon, that tall? She's one of the tiniest little people I've ever seen, and she was a chain-smoking, grumpy, miserable <laughs> piece of work. She was lovely, but she had, <laughs> yeah, and here she is. No, she, she did have a mouth on her. But um, it was great because every single character got to be developed. You know, you could, treat every single one as possibly a close-up goblin who's going to be used more and more. Because when we shot the sequence, we then went back over the following year doing odd pickups and inserts and things. So you never knew when you actually shot the main sequence how many pieces you'd need for any one of these characters because you didn't know which ones would be popular. Mm -hmm. Next clip, please. I think you're sitting on your microphone. Oh, you're not. Uh, no, no you're <laughs> gonna, you're gonna, we're going to be sharing some mics. <laughs> Have mine. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, well, a lot of facial hair was on this film. Um, <laughs> um, Hagrid, the, I think we had the two most naughtiest actors to stick beards on that we could possibly have. Uh, Robbie Coltrane and Michael Gambon were dreadful with their beards. Um, <laughs> they would take them off at lunchtime without me knowing. And uh, it was, We actually had over Dumbledore's um, beard, we used to make a silk um, sort of wrap to go over it at lunchtime, which he, think, he thought it was hilarious to fill it up with chips and things like that at lunchtime. <laughs> um, so we, ha we had our hands full with these uh, actors. There was a lot of facial hair on there. And we had to, they kept us very busy. And Lisa, uh, there was a lot of facial hair, but there had to be very few people other than maybe some of the kids who didn't have wigs on. Yeah, we had a massive amount of wigs. And in actual fact, his is the only wig that is, hasn't got a lace front because he sweats a lot, Robbie, and he doesn't really like lace, so 
I left that <laughs> bit to Amanda. Um, yeah, you have to do him very, very quickly. He doesn't like being in the chair at I all. I think we had 20 <laughs> minutes between us to get him ready. Mm. And Michael Gambon, you'd, uh, you'd get him ready, and he didn't wear a hat in the last scene, so they obviously had to be perfect. And then he'd stick his own hat and glasses on and walk out. <laughs> you say, oh, they're not looking at that. But yeah, they are, actually. <laughs> now, also, I'm going to expect um, that looking at the clothes and looking at the size of him, perspiration wasn't a problem, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> All grumpy. It was a nightmare to keep that beard on. It really was <laughs> a miracle. It did actually, um, Michael Gambon's did actually come off in one scene. They called me in at the end when they said cut. He was, Dan was actually holding his beard. <laughs> mm. Well, it's, it's certainly one way to, to ensure the wrap, isn't it? Can we see the next clip, please? Oh, we've got the breakdown. Lots of um, the last film was more about the characters that we created over the 10 years was more about destroying them. And they had this huge war and we had to destroy them completely. Um, so there was blood and guts and goodness knows what else on, on all of the, nearly all of the cast. And <coughs> I think there's about 162 of them, so um, <laughs> we won't go through them all by name, but there was, there was a lot. <laughs> okay. Next clip, please. Oh, we've got um, Rupert in his disguise here. Um, having been known always as the ginger one, it was quite tricky to make a disguise for him. Um, and again, with his facial expressions, back to the facial hair, back to a beard again. And he's, why he is such a fabulous actor in that part is his facial expressions, which is the worst thing possible for us with a beard. The moment he, he laughed, we had to keep everyone away from him, not telling him jokes, because he'd laugh and it, all the sides would little pop out. And <laughs> Okay, next clip, please. Now, this is an unusual one, because this, this was sort of a, a wonderful melding of uh, prosthetics and CGI. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I can. I'll just look firmly at Mark Coolia, who's sitting over there, uh, because this is his makeup. And Mark's nominated for the Iron Lady, but if there were more spaces on the ticket, Mark, I'm sure, would be sitting up here for this film as well. Over 10 years, his contribution to Harry Potter is very significant. Um, <laughs> that said, this is us. And <laughs> Mark who was it? Um, no, what uh, we did here, we had some concept art on the fourth film, I think, that a guy called Rob Bliss had done of Voldemort turning from a sort of withered fetus thing that we had built uh, into Ray Fiennes. And that artwork kind of drove where we started from. The main thing that was found out when we were very first testing this was if he's covered in, in veins all over and he's going to be sort of airbrushed, it takes forever. And it was Mark who came up with this idea of making everything as transfer tattoos. So we basically mapped an airbrush makeup out flat and then cut it into lots of bits and then had it printed so that we could then put the veins on as a tattoo layer every day, which meant that the continuity theoretically would be perfect. So, and that halved the makeup time. That alone was a very, very clever idea and it worked a treat. He's got um, brow pieces just literally to get rid of his eyebrows. He was really good, Rafe. He agreed to shave his head, which made life fantastic. There was one occasion, I think it was only one day, Mark can correct me, where we had to put a ball cap on him because he had been doing something else and he couldn't shave his head. Um, but that made life you know, much, much easier for us. The decision to lose the nose came from the producer, David Heyman, because he kept going back to the book and it says, oh, he's got this flat face and snake-like face can you do anything? And so we had to prove to him that if you build out anybody's face enough to get rid of the nose, they start looking like a rodent, <laughs> which wasn't going to be good. And I mean, I think, you know, all of us in my department, we are actually, contrary to popular belief, very fond of CG, digital work, because occasionally something comes up where you know damn well that the way to do this properly is digitally. And we basically took his life cast, chiseled the nose off, sculpted umpteen versions of a flat nose, showed them to him and said, well, which one do you want? 
and they scanned it, did a test, and the test was amazing. And it changes him so completely. Um, so it was a wonderful you know, moment. And uh, actually, it was a perfect amalgam of digital and traditional makeup. One of those, one of those uh, places where it, it, uh, it really, really serves a purpose that uh, it couldn't be done by makeup. Maybe a plastic surgeon, but not, uh, <laughs> not makeup. It's tough to lose the nose. All right. Um, let's uh, give a round of applause to these nominees, and let's take a look at this film clip and, and see a little more of this.